international expert that we have as our guest speaker. Thank you very much, Herman. I want to thank uh, the Third World Study Center for uh, jointly hosting this event with the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue. The Center for Humanitarian Dialogue is a member of the International Contact Group on the, on the, on the peace process with the Ubor Islamic Liberation Front and the government of the Philippines. We've been um, working on the, on the peace process as part of this contact group since the collapse of the MOAD in 2008. And one of the key components that came out following that collapse was the creation of a, of a new architecture in the peace process to help support the two parties, to help uh, provide advice to them, uh, and to help ensure that uh, the, the process is a bit stronger and, uh, and uh, as it moves uh, hopefully towards a final agreement. Um, as part of uh, the Center for Humanitarian's dial uh, role in the, in, the, in the dialogue process, we bring in international experts from around the world um, who are experts on some of the key issues that are being discussed in the peace process to uh, talk with the two parties, to provide advice based on experiences in other countries with the idea that while every situation is unique, there are of course many similarities uh, and, and many things that can be drawn on uh, by the parties <coughs> from other countries that might be able to provide some type of creative ideas on how to overcome some of the, the impasses and, uh, and work through to a, a final agreement. So our, our most uh, recent guest, our current guest, is, uh, is George Anderson. And George could, could not uh, have come at a, at a better time right now. Uh, with George's uh, skill set, as some of you have seen on his resume, um, George brings this incredible mix of, of practical experience in government and working on some of these key issues, uh, wealth sharing, uh, natural resource uh, sharing, uh, revenue raising, and so on and so forth. And then, of course, looking at systems of governance around the world uh, through his role in the form of federation. Uh, George also has dealt with these issues within Canada itself, as we all know, uh, familiar with the situation with, with Quebec. And George also has, a, has an academic side to him where he's published uh, quite, uh, quite a bit on the issue of federalism and uh, gas and oil um, and, uh, and other issues relevant very much to what's happening in the, in the peace talks right now. Um, just briefly, a, a little note on the peace talks uh, where we stand right now. As some of you know, as all of you I hope would know, uh, the two parties uh, recently signed uh, uh, an agreement on principles, 10 points on, 10 decision points on, on principles, which has consolidated what they've negotiated, what they've been discussing to date for these two rounds, has also uh, reaffirmed many of the principles that the two parties have uh, agreed on in the past, and has also offered a template for the hopefully for what will be a final agreement very soon. And I think has also offered a, or thrown out a few new things that we haven't seen to date, such as the ministerial form of governance, uh, the reworking of, uh, of a new type of uh, a governance system um, in, um, in, uh, in Mindanao, and, uh, and, and certainly leaving open some legal questions about how to deal with some of these, some of these issues. Um, and now in the next phases, uh, certainly this year will be quite an important year for the peace process, now the two parties will begin to discuss some of the more detailed uh, aspects of how to come up with a, a final agreement. And George's experience on, on wealth sharing um, and uh, natural resources and revenue raising, all of these issues are now, the two parties are now starting to get into these deep details. So having his expertise um, uh, with the two parties has been, been quite helpful and very timely. Um, over the last few days, uh, George and I have uh, traveled down to Cotabato. We met with the MILF panel. We spent uh, most of the, the better part of a full day there uh, with them in a workshop type of, of setting with the Central Committee and the panel, in which we discussed their, their proposals. And then last night, we met with the government panel and also exchanged views on, on, on some of these issues and, and how to, again, come up with creative ways to address some of the, some of the issues that they're facing right now. I, I think uh, we've walked away with a sense that there's no question both parties want to find creative ways to deal with some of these issues. There are, while so much has already been discussed in the future, so much has been agreed on in the past with the 1996 agreement, what have you, this is a new context, these are somewhat different actors, 
Uh, and uh, obviously we've learned a lot of lessons from 1996. And so now I think we're going to have to, and now we're seeing, I'm starting to take a little bit of a step further to try to find, okay, what did we learn from 1996, better and for worse? And what did we learn from other countries too that have done similar situations that we can start to uh, find, a, um, find a creative solution to the process right now? But this is a critical year. Both parties recognize that there's probably never been a more uh, conducive uh, atmosphere uh, time for, for an agreement, and uh, we'll see what, uh, see what we can uh, help them put together in the next few months. So again, I want to thank you all very much for coming here today, and thank uh, particular thanks to the Third World uh, Study Center, and uh, I look forward to a very fruitful uh, exchange today. Thanks very much. Um, thanks, David. Uh, just to add a few things to uh, what uh, David's actually uh, said regarding our uh, guest speaker for today. Uh, Sir Anderson is currently an expert on the, uh, in the 2012 standby team of mediation support unit of the United Nations. He he was a civil servant with the Canadian government and with senior appointments in the Energy, Finance, Foreign Affairs, and Finance Departments before becoming Deputy Minister for Intergovernmental Affairs uh, and of Natural Resources Canada. He was president of the Forum of Federations, an international NGO supported by nine countries from 2005 to 2011. Uh, he got his education at Queen's University and Oxford and the École Nationale d'Administration in, in Paris. Uh, and Mr. Anderson was also a fellow at Harvard University Center for International Affairs from 1992 to 1993. He is the author of the books Federalism, an Introduction, published in 2008, and Fiscal Federalism, an Introduction in 2010 which have been translated into 22 and 12, uh, into 22 and 12 languages, respectively. We'll talk about it being widespread in terms of uh, the scope. Um, he's also editor of the books Oil and Gas and Federal Systems, Internal Markets and Multilevel Governance, both forthcoming in June 2012. Sir Anderson was also mentored at the Trudeau Foundation in 2011, currently seats in Queen's University's Board of Trustees as Vice Chair. So ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce Mr. Anderson. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. And, um, when I was at the Forum of Federations, we, uh, I, I, I went to the Forum of Federations in 2005, and I think just before I got there, uh, they had done a couple or three events here at the University of the Philippines. You were, you were part of that, were you? Uh, where you were having your debate on federalism. And by, I think by the time I got there, things, you know, the mood here had shifted. The feeling was it wasn't quite the subject of the day. Uh, so I never got here when you were having that debate. And I'm delighted to be, to, to, this because this is my first visit ever to your country. And I've been to a lot of countries, so this was certainly what I wanted to get to. Um, so it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, uh, I don't know how our conversation will go today, but we, we might spend a bit of time on the broader subject of, of federalism in, in the Philippines, as well as the specific issue of, uh, of, of the moral people in, in Mindanao. Uh, I, and for me to give a speech on the Mindanao problem is a little bit pretentious, uh, because I, <coughs> I'm certainly I would, what you would call on that subject, a 24-hour expert. Uh, but I can give you some reflections on how you know I see see the issue, having been here in a very very initially, uh, and having met with people and sort of putting it in, a, in some some sort of comparative context. Uh, the one of the things that that drives the push for devolution in, in many parts of the world is identity politics and combined with democratization. And uh, as, as, as societies become more democratic, if, if you have uh, identity groups, whether they're, it's in terms of ethnicity, language, religion, or some combination of those ingredients, where there's a, and, and, and often combined with a sense of discrimination or, or uh, you know, a history of, of maltreatment, uh, these issues of, well, we need to have more say over our own lives come to the fore. And they can play out, <clears throat> they can play out very differently. 
but you know, the, you can see the growth. I mean, identity politics hasn't just arisen with recent democratization. In some cases, countries that have been democratic for a long time, like Belgium, has got into it. So it hasn't been all that healthy, to be frankly, a, uh, in, in the Belgian case into a thing where the, their politics became dominated by the issue of the relation between the, the two large language groups. And they've moved to a federal regime, but it's not a very healthy design for the federal regime that they've had. Uh, when Spain became um, democratic after the fall of Franco, uh, they too moved in the direction of federalizing. Uh, this it was a, an historic claim, particularly by what are called the historic nationalities, the Catalans, the Basques, the Galicians, uh, for a, fe a republican and federal Spain. They would had that in the 1930s before the Civil War, and, and, and uh, the, but they have never used the term. And one of the things that I find very interesting is how you know, well, we are, something we all know, language is, is value-loaded, symbolic in, in importance. And in some countries, the word federal is something that people either embrace or uh, reject. Yeah. And, and you have to distinguish between their preparedness to do certain concrete things with the language they want to use to describe what they're doing. And so, just to flip into our, our Philippine context quite quickly. I mean, our friends that we were meeting in, in Mindanao, I mean, are very attached to the word federal. Uh, but I don't think you will, <coughs> that one of the things I encourage them not to worry too much about is what label gets put on whatever arrangement uh, is made uh, between them and, and the government of the Philippines. And it wouldn't be classically federal anyway, because what we're talking about here in the Philippines is, uh, at least at this juncture, a, uh, a, an autonomous arrangement for a, one region within what will remain a unitary country. Uh, it's possible that it, it, in due course the, the Philippines more generally would federalize, but if it did, I would still see a different set of arrangements for Mindanao, I mean, for, for, for the, the moral uh, area. Uh, because the extent of devolution would be beyond what I would envisage as being likely for uh, the Philippines uh, generally. It's, it's beyond, uh, on, in some areas, it's beyond what one finds in, in I think, any, any, any federation. Uh, in other areas, not, but the, that's, that's part of the tension that we're dealing with there. Uh, so, so Spain moved to decentralize as it democratized. Another example is, is Ethiopia, which is not exactly the world's most democratic country, but when they got rid of, when they got rid of the dirge, which was the uh, very heavy Soviet-style regime they had, uh, it, the Civil War had been won by a group of ethnic liberation fronts, and they came forward with what they called ethnic federalism. And we had some discussion of ethnic federalism with the people in, in, in Mindanao earlier this week. Uh, because federalism by its nature is fundamentally a territorial arrangement. I mean, what you do is, uh, in, in a full federal structure, I mean, the country is divided into territories, each of which has a government which uh, is popularly elected and has certain responsibilities that are established in the Constitution, certain powers and responsibilities. Um, but this idea, of, and, and the classic form of thinking of federalism was uh, not that it sort of reflected ethnicity. Now, as a matter of practice, uh, you know, early federal countries like Switzerland, 19, 1848, Canada, 19, 1867, in both cases, when those federations were formed, uh, the constituent units, I mean, there was an element of ethnicity in, in establishing those constituent units. Uh, Ontario and Quebec and Canada had been combined as one uh, province or one colony under the British between 1840 and 1867. And as part of the deal for creating the federation, they were separated again. Uh, so that Quebec became, 
it kept it kind of a dominant. In those days, the Catholicism was probably as more important than the, the, the language, but the language was very much tied to the Catholicism. But it became a, a majority Catholic, Protestant, uh, French speaking unit, Ontario majority Protestant in those days. I think it's half Catholic now, but uh, in those days it was a majority Protestant and uh, Anglo English speaking. And then other provinces were added in. The, uh, in, in, in Switzerland, uh, Switzerland is a fascinating country. It has a very long history of small local regions being very autonomous. And even now, I mean, it's, it's only a country of five million plus people, but the, uh, with 28 cantons. And uh, it's quite remarkable how decentralized it is. And I, as I say, you know, people sort of say, oh, we can't afford federal, all this overhead and so on. You know, some of the richest countries in the world are federal. Uh, and certainly, I mean, Switzerland is a very rich country and it's very efficiently run uh, for the most part. In Canada, the United States, I mean, if you start running through the list, uh, there's a lot of rich federations. And actually, if you look at the numbers, it, federal structures are, are not appreciably different in cost uh, than uh, non-federal structures. The big costs of government and the programs that are delivered is not the overhead. Uh, in terms of bureaucracy. Uh, you can have issues there, but those are the primary issues. So looking at the situation here, I mean the first thing that it, you know, this is clearly a case of identity politics, clearly a case where there's sort of a long-term sense of free goods and the and the principles that you I think you probably have distributed amongst yourselves this morning uh, recognize that these points. Uh, getting that on the table, getting it recognized by both sides is important because one of the things that I think uh, always runs very strongly through this type of negotiation is symbolism. And it's trying to, dis it's trying to disentangle the symbolic dimension from the more functional or pragmatic dimension is, is very important. And uh, you know, there's a demand in this case you know, from the, the people of the Nadal, they would like, you know, they talk about the word federal, you know, is, is, that's a symbolic word. The idea of having the agreement constitutionalized, there's a pragmatic dimension to that, but there's also a, clearly a symbolic element to it. Uh, and there will be other symbolic issues. And often the symbolic issues are more difficult to deal with than the more functional ones, because uh, they're harder to do, uh, the, the, you know, just, just split in the middle, if I can put it that way. I mean, if, you, if, if the issue is money, uh, you know, you can always add a little or subtract a little, uh, or if it's a, an arrangement around a certain set of responsibilities, you can always make minor adjustments to sort of find a compromise of some type. But the risk with more symbolic issues is that, you know, it's yes or no. And so managing those can become often the most difficult part. And, what you've seen in, in a number of federations where ethnic politics plays in a very important way is it could explode in terms of popular, popular mood, popular anger around a particular incident which is very symbolically important. Um, I mean, I remember in our own country when we had our very uh, intense debates around the official languages in the place of English and French, particularly at the federal level, uh, we had a thing where uh, the air traffic controllers were saying we cannot do bilingual air traffic control and uh, because there's a risk of the planes falling out of the sky, confusion and what have you. And this became a very symbolic issue in Quebec. You know, we have the right to have a French being used as it, it, 